to the day with Raj Fasili. Thank you so much. Um, it's weird, my, my voice in the microphone. <laughs> so, OK. Uh, my talk today is about exploiting some amount of uh, public data to boost the performance of the private learning algorithm and to circumvent some of the existing limitations in differentially private learning. Uh, the first part of uh, this talk is going to be based on, and perhaps the larger part, is going to be based on joint work with Om Thakur and Abradip Thakurta uh, that appeared in Europe's 2018. And uh, in the later part, I'm going to present some recent improvements uh, that I have together with my graduate students and Upamananti. OK, so in this work, we focus on classification problems rather than regression. And uh, we aim to achieve two main goals. The first goal is to devise a framework for privacy preserving predictions for online classification queries. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Imagine a scenario where we have a sensitive and a private training set that is comprised of you know, a bunch of labeled examples that come from unknown distribution. And now suppose we have a sequence of online uh, unlabeled feature vectors that come one at a time. And uh, the goal here is to design a private algorithm, which I'm going to call a priv, that uses a sensitive training set in order to provide predictions in, term, in, in, in terms of labels for these unlabeled feature vectors, one at a time. And here I'm actually making the sort of a more or less standard assumption that uh, those unlabeled feature vectors come from the same marginal distribution as the feature vectors in the training set. And of course, uh, the main requirement here is that we want these output labels uh, to uh, abide by the privacy or to protect the privacy of uh, the sensitive training set. Okay. In the sense of differential privacy, which I'm going to be more precise about in a few slides. And of course, uh, we also want uh, 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 these labels to be as accurate predictions as possible. <coughs> One particular actually design requirement we also try to impose here is that we want to wrap our private algorithm APRIV around any generic non-private learning algorithm. In other words, we want APRIV to have only black box access to any existing non-private learning algorithm. And uh, of course, in addition to the obvious advantage that this would basically uh, uh, you know, allow us to use uh, existing inf infrastructures of learning algorithms that are usually designed without the privacy problem in mind, it will also sort of make our, you know, eventually will make our framework model independent or model agnostic. Because basically, we don't have to care really about the model class we're dealing with or the learning problem we're dealing with as long as we have access to a good non-private learning algorithm for the same problem. So this is a premise. We have access to a good non-private learning algorithm. The second goal. And we can think of the second goal actually as a second phase for this framework. And in this, uh, in this phase, we make the following assumption. Now, suppose that these uh, feature vectors that represent the queries are public information. So they do not entail any privacy concerns. Uh, then in, in this case, the natural thing to do is to basically, uh, after answering enough queries, uh, we can use the newly uh, label data set as a, as a new training set and feed it to, again, any existing non-private learning algorithm and finally output the classifier. Uh, and if actually these labels are kind of generated in a differentially private manner, then by post-processing uh, property of differential privacy, we are fine. This final classifier would be safe to publish and can be used to answer unlimited number of future queries. Uh, of course, this idea is not new. It's no, known as knowledge transfer. Um, and uh, basically, what we, uh, the only difference here is that we do that in a private fashion. And even in the privacy context, there has been other works that consider this uh, framework, or paradigm of uh, knowledge transfer, where you use a new training set to train uh, any good algorithm and finally output a classifier. I'll talk about that in a few slides. So of course, 
course, I guess this slide is completely unnecessary for this kind of crowd, this kind of workshop. But what I wanted to emphasize mainly here is <clears throat> that the fact that we use a standard notion of epsilon delta differential privacy in this work. Okay, one legitimate question would be, okay, why do we need to go through this like two-phase approach where we first answer online queries, classification queries, and then construct a new training set and uh, use kind of any kind of on the shelf, off the shelf learning algorithm to finally output classifier. Why don't we just go to the straightforward standard approach uh, of differentially private learning where we have a simply sensitive training set. You construct an epsilon delta differentially private learning algorithm that runs over the sensitive training set. And uh, usually this algorithm is given a sort of a description for a predefined model class or hypothesis class which I call H, and output some classifier here, which would be safe to publish, because this algorithm is differentially private. And then this, this classifier can be used to you know, answer all uh, classification queries we want. Well, uh, the issue is that there are cert certain limitations with this approach. First of all, uh, it usually requires designing new algorithms, new private algorithms from the scratch, or at least requires some you know, non-trivial white box modification for the existing non-private algorithms. And uh, also, what is perhaps kind of more crucial is that usually the design of such private algorithms uh, uh, require you know, knowledge about the structure of the model class or the structure of the learning problem with data. So in a sense, they are usually model dependent or problem dependent. Uh, the other issue is that in many cases, we already have lower bounds that show that the accuracy or the sample complexity of private learners or learning algorithms in, in the context of the standard approach has necessary dependency on some you know, nasty parameters, like, for example, the size uh, of the model class or the domain size and whatnot, even for uh, simple uh, learning problems like learning expressions which was actually sort of a, uh, the subject of the, uh, one of the previous talks by Amos. So um, one way to kind of circumvent these limitations is to try to relax them a little bit and consider this two-phase approach. We first answer uh, online, online classification queries and then make the assumption that, okay, what if this unlabeled featured vectors we got as queries are actually public? information. So they, for example, they could be provided by what we call opt-in users in the language of mobile data. And in such case, we can make use of this public, uh, this amount of, of unlabeled public data to uh, uh, kind of like avoid this kind of limitations and have also a black box design approach and improve the accuracy of private learning a lot, as we will see in a uh, few slides. Okay, let me recap the design requirements for this framework. First, we want to design a private algorithm that would be able to answer a large number of classification queries. So one of the main challenges in differential privacy is the issue of composition, is that basically privacy loss degrades as we, uh, you know, uh, perform more statistical tasks from the same data set or answer more queries. So here we want, since we want to be able to answer classification queries, we want to design an algorithm that makes the most conservative use of the privacy budget. So that's one issue in this specific framework. The other requirement is that we want to provide not only formal privacy guarantees in terms of uh, differential privacy, but also formal accuracy guarantees in terms of sample complexity bounds or bounds on the expected misclassification rate for our uh, algorithm. And the third requirement is to have this black box design uh, approach. Basically, we want to design, we want our algorithm to be wrapped around any black box non-private learning algorithm. And as I mentioned earlier, that would actually uh, make our framework model agnostic or model independent. 
It has basically moved the burden of the problem onto the underlying non-private learning context. And specifically, this black bo box design approach, in principle, would allow us to have a formal generic transformation statement in which we can say that if we have an accurate non-private learner as an underlying learner, then immediately we will have predictions with compatible accuracy. So you want to be able to prove something like that, very generic transformation. Or the accuracy of the underlying of the non, uh, of the underlying non-private learner to accuracy of our predictions, and finally also the accuracy of the final classifier, which we'll output in the second stage after the knowledge transfer. So basically we want to say that the private prediction will inherit the accuracy of the non-private learner, and the final classifier here, assuming that these feature vectors are, are public, will also inherit this the same accuracy. Of course, there has been a sequence of really nice previous works that uh, studied uh, similar or more or less the same setting. Uh, I will not have time, unfortunately, to go over the details of these nice results in, 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 uh, in this short time, but uh, I'll perhaps uh, highlight the main distinctions between our, our, uh, our, our work and, and, these, and these results. So in a nutshell, all of the previous works either considered uh, or provided constructions that are sort of white box rather than black box or model dependent. Uh, or in some cases, they only analyze a single prediction task rather than a sequence of online queries. And in some cases, they do not provide any formal accuracy guarantees. So in particular, <laughs> the closest uh, related uh, work to ours is the work by uh, Paper Not et al., uh, where they uh, developed this Pate framework. And uh, the idea was, again, the same idea of like uh, employing this uh, knowledge transfer paradigm in a private, in a private manner. Uh, the, it's a nice paper. They actually uh, gave extensive empirical results, but they did not provide any formal accuracy guarantees. There is also second order distinctions. Uh, including, for example, that uh, the algorithmic techniques we're using are quite different uh, from some of the algorithmic techniques used in this course. So let me state our results. Uh, the first, uh, the, for the first goal or the first phase of this framework, we provide a private algorithm, which we call a priv, that is the, uh, uh, achieves epsilon delta differential privacy. And uh, it uses any non-private uh, learning algorithm as a black box. And uh, it can accurately answer much more uh, queries than previous approaches. In particular, it can answer about 1 over eta factor more queries than prior approaches, uh, where eta here is the misclassification rate of the underlying non-private learner. So the more accurate the underlying non-private learner is, the more queries we can answer. And by accurately here, I mean that <coughs> the accuracy of the predictions are compatible, or more or less the same, as the accuracy of the non-private learning algorithm. In this, uh, sure. Uh, does this have like amazing limiting behavior? So if you have a perfect classifier, it will output all of your answers for free? It, you cannot have perfect classifier, assuming like. Uh, Basically, you can. I mean, if you have, if you can, if you can, if you can show that with probability one, uh, your classifier is going to output, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, all, it's going to predict all the labels correctly. Then yes, you can can get privacy for free. You can you can just get the. But basically, in this case, it will be constant function. <laughs> but you know, uh, according to like the standard results in learning theory, we know that uh, there is always you know. Uh, you, you can only you can only show that uh, in the, at least in the packed learning setting, you can show that if you have enough samples, like with high probability, you can, and, so, and then basically the number of samples in order to achieve zero prediction error is infinity because you need something like one or the least dimension by eta in order to the number of samples at least in order to to achieve the learning task, this learning task. So yeah, in a nutshell. Uh, what we wanted to achieve that is that um, you know something that basically transform or transfer the, uh, the uh, accuracy guarantees 
of the of the non-private learner into something uh, tangible in the sort of the prediction that we provide privately. In the second uh, in the second phase, uh, what we give is like again we uh, employ this uh, uh, knowledge transfer paradigm, and again like uh, after enough number of uh, uh, queries after we answer a certain number of uh, public unlabeled data, uh, we can use them as a new training set and finally train any, again, black box number private learner and get uh, uh, out of the classifier, uh, which is more or less what is done in previous works like the Petit framework. But uh, perhaps the uh, uh, new contribution here is that we provide uh, uh, a uh, formal accuracy guarantees in terms of private sample complexity bounds uh, in the formal back learning model. And our bounds are compatible to the non-private, uh, the standard non-private bounds in, in particular. Uh, they are completely characterized by the VC dimension of uh, the, the concept class. And uh, um, I want to say briefly that uh, recently, we uh, improved over the construction that appeared in EURIPS. Uh, together with my grad student, we show a modification, a very simple modification of this construction that uh, fixes some issues with agnostic learning set. So, I'll try, by the way, related to this question about accuracy, to be more formal later in the talk about the notions of accuracy and misclassification rates to, to uh, avoid any confusion. Uh, but let me first kind of give you a high level idea of the sort of the uh, a description of uh, our main construction, APRI, for uh, the uh, online classification queries. And the algorithm is based on a combination between two uh, powerful techniques in, in the literature of differential privacy, mainly subsample and aggregate uh, technique, and its specific manifestation as the distance to instability framework uh, that appeared uh, in uh, a work by uh, Adam and uh, Abradeep in 2013, and the other popular technique, the sparse vector technique. So, um, as we'll see that uh, the uh, Ex the exploiting the sparse vector technique will allow us to make this conservative use of the privacy budget and use the inherent niceness uh, of the data uh, in order to ensure that uh, we don't pay uh, for privacy when we don't need to. So, uh, the first step of the algorithm is to split our private training set into k disjoint partitions. And here, k actually is really an important parameter. It has to be set carefully in order to ensure that we achieve the target accuracy and also the target privacy, or keep the privacy loss in check. But I'm not going to bug you with like, you know, my expressions and uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, low-level details in the stoke. But uh, just believe me that this needs to be set carefully. But uh, uh, apart from this, once you have the right choice for k. We partition the training set into k disjoint chunks and then use each chunk to train your favorite non private learning algorithm. And hence, we end up with a collection of k classifiers, uh, which I call h1 through hk. And now, for each incoming query, each unlabeled feature vector, we uh, obtain the votes of these classifiers for that feature vector. Uh, and here, uh, I'm going to assume that we're dealing with a binary classification problem, but the, this construction can be easily extended to multi-label uh, classification problems. Okay, so uh, what we do next is we uh, simply count the number of zeros and count the number of ones and compute the gap or the margin between the count of ones and the count of zeros. And the intuition is as follows. Like, Suppose that we want to um, a study the stability of the majority vote with respect to the input training set. So intuitively, when this margin is large, then the majority vote is going to be stable with respect to few changes in the input training set. And hence, at least intuitively, we would expect it to be safe to output the majority vote when this margin is large enough. Uh, but of course, this margin is a deterministic function of the training set, so we cannot just out, 
uh, make the, a decision based directly on the margin. So we do the stability test in a differentially private way, which is basically the idea in the distance to instability framework by Adam and Abradib in 2013. We add first a little bit of noise to that gap or this margin and then test whether the noisy margin is large enough. If the answer is yes, we say that the prediction is stable, it's fine to release the majority vote. If no, it's unstable, meaning that we're going to pay for privacy. And uh, in this case, uh, we output it randomly. But we output something that is independent of the data. So what is the best thing independent of the data? Just randomly. OK. So, so far, uh, this is basically uh, a, a, an instantiation of the distance to instability framework. So far, I didn't say what is the role of sparse vector, which will come later. Uh, the idea here is basically that we can show using the noise properties is that if the margin is already sufficiently large, then with high probability, the output of this, pr uh, of this procedure is going to be the majority vote. Okay, so we're always guaranteed to output the majority vote when the margin is large. Now, <clears throat> so this is uh, you know distance to instability framework uh, at, for a single prediction. Now, we use here the sparse vector technique in order to be able to argue that we, can, we, we need only to pay for privacy uh, when we encounter unstable queries, okay? unstable predictions. In particular, we can show that by exploiting uh, the sparse vector technique within uh, the online version of this algorithm, uh, we can show that to ensure epsilon delta differential privacy over the entire sequence of predictions, uh, the algorithm needs to halt only after encountering k squared about k squared epsilon squared unstable queries. In particular, we don't pay for the stable queries in terms of privacy. Um, so let me now give you sort of a, a uh, uh, generic transformation statement um, and try to formally argue that um, the uh, accuracy of the underlying non-private learner can be uh, or w should, would imply accuracy for the uh, output predictions. So suppose now that we have the following premise that the underlying non-private learning algorithm uh, has misclassification rate which is bounded by eight. By which I mean that for each one of these k classifiers, the uh, uh, expected classification error or the probability of misprediction is bounded by this eight. Suppose this is true. Then we can show that uh, the number of misclassification that our <coughs> APRIV, our uh, private algorithm, makes over m queries is bounded, bounded by some constant, about three, m8. In other words, within this uh, M online queries, the, uh, uh, a, 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 our, our private misclassification rate is going to be at most 3.8. So in other words, we say this is a sort of black box transformation for the misclassification rate of the non-private learner to misclassification rate for the private uh, uh, predictor. So uh, an eta misclassification rate would be transformed to 3.8. And the idea of the proof is actually pretty simple. So mainly we use a, a very simple counting argument to show that you know, for all the queries, except for at most three M eta bad queries or unstable queries, uh, in all the other queries, a significant majority of the classifiers in the classifier ensemble will agree, and they will agree on the correct label. So not only would have consistency or consensus or agreement among uh, the, the, those, uh, those classifiers, but they will also agree on the correct label. So we'll have stability, and hence, by the distance to instability framework, this means that, that the margin will be large and we'll output the majority vote, but also due to the accuracy of all the classifiers, because you have low misclassification rate, they will also agree on the correct label. So we'll also have accuracy for the generated predictions. So in other words, we can say that for all the stable queries, uh, whose, whose fraction is roughly 1 minus eta out of the m queries, we will have right classifications. We'll have a right, like the cor correct prediction. We'll make correct predictions. Uh, for the unstable 
uh, queries that we don't know. And we will make roughly about a constant factor of the misclassification rate of the underlying non-private learner as errors. Sorry? Hmm? Um, shouldn't your misclassification rate of the black box depend on k? Also set K to be as large as yeah, that's true. Yeah, definitely. I, I swept all this under the rack. So let me go back, actually. So basically, this thing, we know that from the privacy analysis of sparse vector that this is the, the sort of the number of unstable queries that, or the, the, basically, this is the cutoff. You have to stop it here. So have to tune the number of like unstable queries that you would expect to this. The idea is like when the non-private learner has misclassification rate eta, the number of unstable queries using this counting argument is going to be roughly m times eta. And hence, we have to tune this to m eta, and this will give you a setting for k. In terms of m, the number of queries you're answering, and in terms of the misclassification uh, guarantee of the, uh, of the uh, non-private learning algorithm. OK, so you, you, you get this eta from learning theory. Yeah, yeah, it's a black box promise. So I'm going to, for now at least, uh, I'm going to assume that you know we trust this promise, uh, but it doesn't have any. So you know this. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, this assumption about eta, about the misclassification rate of the non-private learning, uh, learning learning algorithm, does not have any impact on the privacy guarantee. So we still whatever what we're gonna stop after that. It only impacts accuracy. I am just saying that the the, the, the more data you have, perhaps the classification error is smaller, and so it's a function of k. Right, right. So yeah, yeah, true, true, true. So basically, that's true. So in order, uh, definitely. But we have to kind of like stick to certain formal model in order to analyze what is n or the number of data points. That's true. But you're right. So you can think of k as a constant am amplification, or like a, sorry, an uh, amplification factor for the sample complexity of the non-private learners. So basically, we want to ensure that each one of these k classifiers are, are accurate. So you have to kind of like multiply everything by k in terms uh, of like this is still in the realizable setting. Right. For now, you don't have to look at back learning. It's just like a black box premise. Oh. Underlying non-private learning algorithm has this much classification. We're fine, regardless of how we get this. I'll talk about back and agnostic back in five minutes. I hope. Right. But it's a great question. So now. Uh, once we have this simple transformation statement, uh, we can easily show, it's very obvious, that this implies that we can answer about 1 over 8 and more queries than approaches that are based directly on uh, the advanced composition of the French privacy. Why? Because we're only paying for privacy for eta m queries rather than all the m queries. This is more or less the idea. Now, we can then move to the next phase of like knowledge transfer. Now, suppose we answer enough queries. M is sufficiently large. Uh, and this uh, featured ve vectors are public. Then we can use this new training set uh, to train, again, any non-private learning algorithm and finally output a classifier. And again, uh, we can formally uh, reason about the accuracy of the final classifier by combining two, two simple facts. The first is that. If we assume that the underlying non-private learner in APRIV is accurate or have low misclassification rate, then APRIV will have low misclassification rate. And hence, this training set will inherit this low misclassification rate. So the, low, the, the, the new training set S hat will also have low misclassification rate. And now, again, if the external non-private learner B tilde is, is good learner, meaning it would generate a classifier that ha, uh, uh, have, have high accuracy, this, then we would expect that the output classifier of this learner, learning algorithm, will have a misclassification rate that is close to, to the misclassification rate in its input training set. So basically, the final accuracy or the expected misclassification rate of the final classifier uh, will uh, be compatible to uh, the uh, accuracy of the underlying non-private learning algorithm. Now, let me try to be more formal in the last few, how much? 10, 12 minutes? 12. In the last few minutes, and um, uh, talk about a formal analysis for APRIV 
in the formal pack learning model. And just to remind us the distinction between the two uh, settings in, in pack learning, there is a special case of realize, uh, which is called the realizable case, and the more general agnostic case. And uh, in both cases, we're given a hypothesis class or a model class H. And uh, the difference in the, uh, the main difference in the realizable case is that uh, we make the assumption that the true labeling function uh, comes from that hypothesis class. Okay? So all the uh, 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 featured vectors in the training set are labeled by this H star. And now we say that uh, an algorithm B is alpha pack learner. Uh, if given enough samples, it output a classifier, h hat, whose expected error uh, on a fresh sample is bounded by alpha. Okay? And as a standard result in learning theory, uh, we know that with high probability this can be achieved as long as n, or the number of samples in the training set, is about the VC dimension of this class by alpha, where VC dimension is complexity measure for the hypothesis class. Standard complexity measure. Uh, okay, so um, the difference in the agnostic case, which is the more general case, is that uh, if we uh, uh, we remove the assumption, the realizability assumption that uh, uh, the true labeling function comes from uh, from H, uh, uh, all the examples can come from any arbitrary distribution, and uh, in this case we say that an algorithm is alpha agnostic path learner. Uh, if given, again, enough samples, it output a classifier such that the expected true error, or the true error of the H hat on a fresh sample from the distribution is bounded by alpha plus gamma. And here, gamma is something out of our control. Basically, it's the approximation error, or the, the, the minimum possible error that can be achieved by any hypothesis in my class. And again, uh, the standard result in learning theory is that with n about VC dimension by alpha squared, we can always achieve alpha agnostic path learning. But what I wanted to kind of like clarify here or emphasize here is that alpha we can control. Basically, we can make alpha arbitrary small as long as we increase uh, sample size. But gamma, in the agnostic case, we can't. Right? It's constant. It depends really on the class we have. So now, applying this uh, generic transformation result, uh, 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 in the uh, pack learning model, let's first start with the realizable case. So assume, assuming that the underlying non-private learner is alpha pack learner for the model class, then APRIV will inherit this and we will, can say that, it, uh, that APRIV will have a misclassification rate bounded by 3 alpha. Okay. So constant amplification for alpha here is not significant because we can make it arbitrary small by increasing the sample size. But in the agnostic case, it will be uh, some issue, some problem. Because if we assume that the underlying non-private learner is alpha agnostic back learner, so there is no realizability assumption, then we can only say that APRIV will have a misclassification rate 3 alpha plus 3 gamma. Now, if gamma is small, we're fine. That's fine. But if gamma, like, analog it's not the same, but it's analogous to the base optimal somehow, right? So it's not in our control. So if it's gamma is like large, like 10% or something, a constant amplification by a factor of three is going to, to, uh, 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 to make a problem, to be problematic in, in general. This is an issue that we have to deal with. And uh, for that reason, we kind of like apply, uh, we make a, a small modification to our construction in order to actually deal with this issue. and. Uh, you know, get rid of this extra constant next to the approximation error. So this is a recent result that's still unpublished. Uh, and the idea of this modification is based on pre-processing of the training set before feeding it to a priv, to our private predictor. And basically, uh, the technique is based on relabeling the training set, so the training set is non uh, it's not realizable. OK, let's make it realizable. <laughs> so the idea is to relabel really the training set. And uh, this relabeling procedure actually follows exactly the same, uh, the, uh, it, a beautiful technique that appeared in work by uh, Amos and, and, and Kobe and Uri in 2015. It's called the label, label boost technique. 
And basically, this would allow us to reduce the agnostic case to the realizable case, and we know to, that you know our APRIF can deal with the with the, with the reliable case. The caveat here is basically that this procedure, this pre-processing step, not all, always computationally efficient. But who cares? In agnostic learning, <laughs> we, it's usually the case that we don't have computationally efficient learning in the first place. But of course, this is for the proper learning case. I'm not sure what will happen in the uh, proper case. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, still black box? Uh, no. No, no, that's, that's, also, that's also something that it's not exactly black. It's a genetic, so you can do the same procedure for any hypothesis. It's not for a specific hypothesis. You can still do uh, this uh, pre-processing step for any edge, but of course not exactly black box. So the black box part is going to be after this pre-processing step. The only thing also I want to emphasize here, which is a good point, uh, is that this is done once and for all, right? So you do this pre-processing step, and then you can use it for online classification all the time. That's right. Online classification queries. And the in online classification queries phase, you can stick to any black box uh, pack learner as an underlying learning algorithm. Good. So, uh, so let me uh, quickly uh, give a brief description of this nice, nice uh, technique uh, due to BNS 15. Uh, and the idea is basically we're going to start, this is a training sample, we're going to start with a little bit more samples than the non-private sample complexity. It's about like one over epsilon uh, factor more samples. And then we're going to do subsampling by epsilon fraction. And the reason of this, it's actually not important for the sake of the talk, but the reason of the subsampling step is to keep the privacy loss in check at the very end. Okay. So now, uh, let's, let's start from the subsampled uh, uh, training set. The first step we're going to do after that is to remove the two labels and keep them aside. Okay. So we end up with an unlabeled version of the training sample. And now the size of that unlabeled version is about the non-private sample complex. Now, what we're going to do is like uh, we'll generate all the dichotomies that the hypothesis class H can generate on the unlabeled sample. And by Sauer's lemma, we know that there is only polynomial number of dichotomies. And each dichotomy can be represented by some representative hypothesis in the class. So we end up with a set of representative hypotheses, which are polynomial is polynomial in M, the, whose number is polynomial in M. Now, what you're going to do later, it's not us, but like what was in this paper, basically the Rayleigh Boolean procedure, uh, is that uh, you apply the exponential mechanism on the top of this uh, set in order to select one hypothesis H hat that approximately has the least empirical error. So the score function is basically would be the number or the negative of the number of disagreements with the two labels. So this is the score function of the exponential mechanism. And hence, basically, you can think of H hat as something that will be, uh, will have a low disagreement trait with the ERM hypothesis, okay? the hypothesis that have the least empirical error. Now that's it. You're going to use this H hat to relabel yourself. And now, uh, the key lemma actually that appeared in BNS, well, they used this label boost for uh, a different purpose for the semi supervised case, uh, uh, learning under privacy. <coughs> but uh, 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 this procedure is very actually uh, kind of powerful because uh, it come up with like very, this very useful lemma. Um, so this relabeling procedure on its own is not private. It's not differentially private. However, if you have a differentially private algorithm A, and then if you look at the composition of A and this relabeling procedure, then this composition remains differentially private. So basically, if you apply a differentially private procedure on the output of, of this relabel procedure, uh, the whole thing would remain epsilon delta differentially private. So that's a key, uh, key uh, point, because we're going to now use our APRIV on the top of that, like we will, we will compose the APRIV algorithm after this relabeling procedure, and the entire procedure will, stay, will remain epsilon delta differential private. The other observation about this, which I already mentioned, is that 
the relabeling function, h hat, uh, have low disagreement rate with the ERM hypothesis on, on, the, on the training set. Now, um, this is like the, the, almost the last slide. Um, the slide before the last. OK, so I just wanted to kind of like um, quickly describe what is going to happen. And that basically, we're going to use this relabeling procedure to relabel re the sample. And now we have to do something that is basically to ensure that the input to APRIV is ID. So what we do is like sample the same amount of examples from S hat uh, and feed it to APRIV. And now that's it. We're going to use APRIV to generate the private labor for the in online course. And here's something that I didn't mention is that we start again with a little bit more sample for example than the previous slide. So there is an, you know, a, a, an expansion factor here rho that really depends on the number of queries you want to answer. Depends on M. <coughs> so one thing actually in the analysis that we need to be careful about is that given the sort of the you know, the guarantees we have from this relabel procedure, and also because we hear sample from the empirical distribution. But we can only show at, at that point, what, what is obvious is that the empirical disagreement rate between APRIV, our algorithm viewed as a classifier, and the ERM hypothesis, the underlying ERM hypothesis, is low. But this is only the empirical disagreement, meaning that APRIV will have low training error on the original training set. Well, this is not enough, of course, to argue that the expected misclassification rate of APRIV on fresh samples is going to be low. But, OK, like empirical disagreement rate is low would imply that also the expected disagreement is low using a simple uniform convergence argument. So we can show easily that if this is low, then the expected disagreement between APRIV and the RMI pass is also going to be low. And hence, we're back to the realizable case. Now, our reference hypothesis is the ERM hypothesis, which comes from the class, from the hypothesis class. So it's realizable. And we can go from there. Right? So we label everything like in APRIV as if this is our H star. And eventually, because the ERM hypothesis has a good misclassification, according like to based on uh, standard uh, results in learning theory, the ERM hypothesis uh, achieve a alpha agnostic pack learning, so it has a good expected misclassification rate, then we can easily show that APRIV will inherit that, and the, the final misclassification rate of APRIV in expectation will be O of alpha plus gamma. So we kind of like get rid of the extra three or the constant factor next to the approximation error. And again, we can use this in the knowledge transfer setting where we uh, wait until we answer about uh, M online queries, where M here is a, a non-private agnostic sample complexity. And then we use the newly labeled uh, uh, set as a training set, feed it to any of the shelf agnostic pack learner, and finally output uh, a classifier, H final. And using the same line of analysis, we can show that the expected misclassification rate or expected error of, uh, of of this hypothesis is going to be O of alpha plus gamma. And what's interesting here is that the associated private sample complexity, which is the n we have to start with in order to finally output a classifier here in this two-phase procedure that have such error guarantee, is that this expression. Okay? So if you look at the sample complexity, you can see that if epsilon is a constant, and if alpha, the excess risk, is less than one of the, over the visa dimension, then basically you don't pay for privacy. Like it's the same as a non-private sample complexity in this case. So if alpha is small and epsilon is a constant. Okay, that's it. So I'm just uh, going to sum up quickly. Uh, in this work, we consider this two-phase approach where first we provide a privacy predict, uh, preserving predictor that can answer a large number of classification queries. Uh, and uh, it uses any uh, existing non-private algorithm as a black box. 
And the accuracy guarantee is really based on the premise that the underlying non-private learner is, has good accuracy. Uh, in some cases, to impose this uh, good accuracy constraint on the underlying non-private learner, perhaps we have to make, uh, to, to relax this black box statement a little bit. But in general, uh, this generic transformation holds uh, as, as long as the non-private learner is good. And in the second phase, we do the knowledge transfer and finally show formal uh, private sample complexity bound and give a modification for the construction to deal with the agnostic case. And that's it. Thank you. Time for as many questions as people want. <laughs> okay. So, so if I understand the, the, the idea of the proof correctly, um, you, all, all you need is that uh, suppose of an indifferent split and the, the, the train classifier, although they're not getting the correct accuracy, as long as they are wrong and they're wrong in the same way, as, as, as long as they, they, they agree with each other, then it's not going to um, um, affect you in, in terms of this, this black box prediction. Right. As long as, as, long as uh, here you're talking about the accuracy guarantee or the privacy? So the privacy is always. I, I'm talking about the accuracy guarantee. The accuracy, yes. About potential alternative way of getting um, this, this independence on, on this gamma parameter. Ah, in the agnostic suppose, case. Suppose all, all your classifiers are stable. Right. Suppose for every given data point, the kind of prediction that they're going to make mistakes on, they're going to make the mistake on the same, in the same way. Sure. Yeah. If this is the case, we can. But like in agnostic learning, we cannot ensure this all the time. Actually, they could be highly you know, inconsistent in right. the agnostic case. Not. But, yeah. but uh, that's like suppose it is really your. If you have stability, model. another another you know you know independent assumption of stability, then you can maybe pull off something like. I mean, yes. it could be an assumption, but it also could be something that you can show. In in the algorithm, yes, with specific. But now it's it's you have to, assume, you know, this construction will 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 have to uh, be algorithmic dependent somehow. You have to uh, kind of like. You know, impose the stability in the way you design the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that this could lead to a, a computationally efficient algorithm. Sure. I mean, uh, well, in agnostic case, we don't know about that. But like, if we go for regression problems or continuous learning, or something like surrogate loss, of course, you can apply these ideas and use stability uh, to to impose this consistency. True. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I remember from the cleaners paper is that the generic up and downs for, for pack learning, uh, private pack learning, uh, have dependence on uh, on the size of the concept class. Is that coming out in, in, in your results? No, no. It's only no. completely co because we make we make a relaxation here that the featured vectors are public. The online queries are unlabeled featured vectors, oh, I see. and they are public. There is no. We only protect the original training set. And that, that is a relaxation, definitely. I see. Okay, okay. So, and hence, we can show that we can give sample complexity bound that only depends on the least damage. By the way, I need to also, which I didn't say, uh, forgive me about that, this thing has also been considered in previous works by, uh, I think, uh, Kamalika and uh, Daniel Su and also Kobe and uh, Uri and uh, Amos uh, in a setting that is kind of like closely related to this. Uh, where they only consider uh, a scenario where the labels only are private, but in the training set, but the featured vectors are not. So uh, you can see you can see that basically any algorithm for the setting I showed here can be used to uh, a, a kind of like uh, tackle or deal with this private learning uh, label setting. Uh, but also interestingly, in their work, the construction that they use more or less can be used also. In the, in, the, in the settings where you have uh, public feature vectors and private training set, completely like the labels and the feature vectors are private, but separate uh, 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 set with, with unlabeled data that are public. They're, they're construct but their construction, as I, as I mentioned before, was like uh, that appeared in 2015, was, was uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, was white box. So they, they use the exponential mechanism. And then you can show, kind of in this case, you can show also. Uh, bounds that depends on o only on the visa dimension as well. 
Uh, one distinction also between um, our work and the previous work is that we consider online queries. Sort of most of the construction of the previous work look at batch setting, where you have all the public data, unlabeled data at hand, and then you can use it to construct an alpha net or something and then run the exponential mechanism on the top. This is the idea. But in our case, we kind of like impose that the queries come in online fashion. You have to respond with labels uh, before you kind of use the, uh, the new training set. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does, OK, so you've been assuming that you have a collection of unlabeled data. Have you given thought to how you could generate said collection without having it ahead of time? And generated? Yes. From what? <laughs> That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Is uh, this like completely impossible and I just don't know it? Or is this just hard? Like, I'm imagining that people uh, just randomly guess. Well, well, so, no, no, but like, uh, here's the thing. So what this boils down to, at least in the batch case, if you have public unlabeled data, is it's equivalent to learning or knowing the marginal distribution, okay? So what, what is more or less you can imagine is like, if you have enough public unlabeled data, you can use them to, you know, learn the marginal distribution uh, on the features, and then once you learn the marginal distribution, actually private learning become easy because you can't create an epsilon. So I guess maybe your question is like, what if we have some partial information about the marginal distribution, right? So, you know, some, some prior, for example, about the marginal distribution. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question, and uh, we're kind of currently working on something similar to that. That's, it's a legitimate question. Definitely. So when you say marginal distribution, you mean? Dx, like the distribution of the features. Yeah. So you can create an epsilon net. But not just the individual marginals for every coordinate, kind of just the No, 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 no. The whole thing, on the whole feature vector. Without the labels. Without the labels, yeah. Without the labels. All right, so like, it's sort of like a setting where you sort of know, know the distribution, sort of. Uh, right, but, yeah, well, labels. no, but uh, yes and no. Because here, here you don't see the entire, in order to know the distribution, the obvious thing to do, you need VC over alpha squared, mm -hmm. public uh, unlabeled sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here we impose a, a sort of the constraint, you have to, it's online, so you have to respond with a private label. Yeah. So you don't have, if you have them beforehand, that much samples beforehand, yes, it becomes more or less, you know, you can create an epsilon net, at least, you know, information theoretically, you can do this. I guess I was going to say another answer that has appeared in previous work like Sasha's is that uh, often you have opt-in users, like they are uh, Firefox users who right. agree to right. use exactly. data or exactly. are willing to uh, have a weaker privacy guarantee. True. True. Actually, I had a slice for an example, but I just removed them, omitted them about that, right, before, just before the talk. So in cases where you have, you know, user with with uh, no privacy concerns, then you can use such data. Yeah. Very good talk.